I'm Dr. Rick Green from the Medical School Class of 1970, and I'd like to welcome you to this series of interviews where we honor our wonderful faculty at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. This is a program of the Medical School Alumni Association, and today I'm absolutely honored uh, to have Dr. Irv Krohn with us, who is the uh, Professor of Surgery, the Watts Professor, and also the Chair of Surgery at the University of Virginia. Irv, welcome. Well, it's great to be here, and great to be with an old friend. Thank, Thank you, you Rick. So. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, in, in this, uh, sort of these fireside chats, the first thing I, I often ask is, how did, how did somebody get to Charlottesville? Now, I know, I know about your background. You went to uh, Medical College of Wisconsin. You went to Penn undergraduate. You went to Maine Medical for your surgery uh, residency. How does a guy like that get to Charlottesville, Virginia? That's a really good question. The short answer is by car. But, <laughs> but the, uh, the longer answer was this. I, I had planned to be a rural general surgeon, so that's why I picked the Maine Medical Center. And, it was one of the few places in the country you could do orthopedics and neurosurgery and shoot almost anything you wanted. And uh, it turned out they had a, a very strong heart program. It was one of the busiest in New England at that time, and they asked if I was interested in coming back and joining them. So I thought that sounded like a good plan, and, and it, those days was before the uh, cardiac surgical matches. So you just interviewed different places, and most, most of those guys had trained in Michigan. I heard about Virginia, and I heard about Harry Muller, and I heard he was not only an excellent surgeon, but a gentleman. And at that time, there weren't any gentlemen in cardiac surgery, truthfully. <laughs> One of the things I insisted on was going to the operating room everywhere to see how the residents were being treated. And most places were, were dreadful, and I come here, and God, these were like nice people, and they were doing good work, and I decided I had to come to UVA for my training. And fortunately enough, they thought that was a good plan. So that's how I ended up in Charlottesville. And then when I was you know, finishing up, I had a job offered back in Maine. I had a couple other things. And one day, uh, Stan Nolan and Harry Muller asked if I was interested in staying. So I turned I said, sure, why not? And that's how I ended up at UVA. It was a great decision for us, absolutely. Yeah. So in 2002, you took over as chair. Um, what are some of the challenges that you faced as, as chairman and, uh, you know, some of the things that you would impart to a, a young academic surgeon who was thinking of going the same route that you were? Well, you know, it, it's truly learning on the job and if you, you know, you've heard the statement, if you see one academic institution, you've seen one academic institution, they're all so terribly different. So, it was, it, it's, one of the things I learned when I became chair, I, there's a guy named Ed Miller. You know Ed, I'm sure. Ed sure. was one of our anesthesiologists. He subsequently became chair of anesthesia at Columbia, then Hopkins, and dean at Hopkins. Well, Ed was a close friend and colleague, helped me start my research career. And when he went to uh, Columbia, I asked him, exactly what have you done, Ed? And he said, I don't know enough to have done anything. So I'm doing anesthesia, and I'm re-recruiting my faculty. That was an easy thing for me. I went to the operating room and we recruited a wonderful faculty that Scott Jones had brought there, as if they were fresh recruits for me. And those were the first things I did. So it worked out pretty well. We've lost, we lost very, very few faculty over the years. None when I became chair, and that was certainly a time of tension for a lot of people. And uh, I take great pride in that. Well, I certainly want to congratulate you. You've been named this year as uh, an outstanding distinguished researcher at the University of Virginia, which is a, a major honor. So combining clinical work with research, it's always been that, you know, surgeons have been uh, thought of as not really being involved in basic science or even a lot of clinical research. How, how have you managed to do that? How have you managed to balance that career? Well, it's complicated. As you can imagine, um, I don't see it as that different from what we do. Surgeons, by de almost by definition, are problem solvers, aren't they? Difficult case, how do we make it better, how do we do things? And I used, thought that science was an important way to solve problems. We're thought of, you know, because we're not full-time in the laboratory, that's a bad thing, but we're thinking about these problems full-time. 
So basic scientists and even translational scientists really understand the technologies. We understand the clinical problems. They're in our face. And so it was a great joy to be able to do it. Now the problem comes in is time management, of course. So when I sent my first NIH grant, and I, was, I started off hugely busy clinically, and I maintained, uh, that's what I like to do, I'm a surgeon, that's what I get to do, and I take great pride in that. But I sent my first NIH grant in, and it was so bad they should have put me in jail. It was a terrible <laughs> grant. I can, I can objectively tell you it was terrible. And so, I, again, I'm going to use Ed Miller example. I, I asked Ed Miller to review the grant, and he wrote me this letter, which I still have in my desk drawer. He said, you know, not everyone could be good at science. <laughs> I still have this. He said, you're a great surgeon. You know, you, that, do what you like doing. Mm -hmm. Well, in fact, he said, if you're not going to do science like you do surgery, don't do it. And I, and I, so I kept that letter, and I realized that you couldn't just do science at the end of the day. You couldn't just do it if you had a moment free. I had to decide this was a priority to you. So I, I, I'm not sure I took it the way he expected me to take it, but I did it my way. And, and then subsequently, um, you know, within a few years, not right away, I started getting NIH grants funded and been funded certainly for about the last 25 years. Which is wonderful. Yeah. I'm always intrigued with people who went into cardiac. I, I was going into cardiac surgery I, in my training and then sort of from serendipity made a decision to go into cancer and surgical oncology, but tell me about cardiac and why did you want to go into cardiac surgery and would you do it again if you had a choice? Oh, those are great questions. So, I, you know, I never did things. When I was in med school, I was going to be a pediatrician. That's what I was going to do. There were ten people who were freshmen in my class who were going to be cardiac surgeons because it was early in the era. Not a single one of them either went into cardiac surgery or surgery for that matter. Because if you're going back then, you're doing because your mom or dad wants you to do it. That's not the right reason. But for me, when I got to Maine, I realized that cardiac surgery was one of the areas where you could blend physiology and science with surgery. And, it's, and the precision was beautiful. You know, the ability to do operations that are physiologically correct and follow these patients, you know, uh, based on their heart function and instead of, we've always done it that way kind of thing. What are they doing? How are they doing? Can you figure that out? Can you sort it out? And I love that aspect of it. The science behind it was fantastic. And truthfully, when you're a resident, you don't know what the surgery would be like because, you know, you don't get anywhere near it, right? And if you're a general surgical resident, you know, I could stand like three, three houses away. But once I actually started doing the surgery, it's just beautiful surgery. It's clean and thoughtful and, uh, and you know, you get results right away, you know, the work you do. Ten years later, you know how well you've done, right? It, you know, they've survived, Absolutely. and it's wonderful that that happens. I can tell pretty much when they leave the operating room. So if a young resident wants to go into cardiac surgery, what are you looking down uh, 10, 15 years from now to tell that resident about where to go? What, what should his or her niche be, and perhaps even in research? Oh, those, those are great questions. You know, you asked me earlier, would, you, would I do cardiac surgery again? Absolutely. You know, no doubt about that. It's an extraordinary thing because you keep inventing things. I know you do in, in many other fields, but you really keep inventing. And the field has totally changed. There isn't anything I learned as a resident that we're still doing today. The way we put valves in, the way we operate on people, our technologies, and they keep changing. So, so if someone uh, was to say, I want to do cardiac surgery, I would say, be sure that you keep wanting to learn because everything you're going to learn from me is going to be different 10 to 15 years from now. It's not knowing the science, but rather being willing to use those techniques to relearn new technologies, new methodologies, and frankly, new science. Tell me a little about your interests outside the operating room, outside of medicine. What do you like doing? Well, that, uh, there's a lot of things I really enjoy doing. Uh, I've always played tennis. I was a you know, reasonable tennis player in a previous life and still try doing that. But one of my passions is basically being outdoors. My family, many years ago when my oldest son was 10 and my second guy was 8, they said, Dad, we've got to start fishing and it must be fly fishing. <laughs> and I'm sure they watched one of these ESPN shows because I certainly never fished, didn't know anything about it. So we decided as a family we're going to start doing this. 
And this has become a family passion, not about catching the fish, but trout and other creatures like live in beautiful places. And so this has been a family passion between all my kids and, and my wife. This is what we do. And, you know, most every trip we go on, we're going to spend a day somewhere pretty fishing. Not catching necessarily, but fishing. Hopefully yeah. still around Charlottesville. Well, we, we, there are lots of great places around Charlottesville. We, we would plan to live around Charlottesville. But and in fact, I love to travel. And my, my wife loves to travel. And, you know, we're kind of foodies, so we like going to interesting places to eat and such like that. So, so there's a lot of good things to do. You know, many people, when they think about finishing their career, like you're probably thinking about at some point, uh, they, they, they leave medicine. They don't want anything to do with medicine. What, what are your thoughts about medicine in the, in the remaining uh, of, your, of your life? What, what role would that take? Yeah, that's a great question. So the generation, I would say, before mine and probably yours, is, uh, was the business that you never left the operating room, you never left it behind, you know, if you were in academics and you always sort of showed up and, and that's it. And, and the reality is, I, I don't think that's correct. So I will always be interested in the science. You know, I hope to maintain my research for a while longer. But we're all aging athletes. That's the reality. The surgery I do is hard surgery. And, and, uh, and I'm lucky enough to have these really interesting cases sent to me from all over. But there are cases no one wants to do because they're so darn hard. So you can't do those forever. So you need to leave that two to three years before anyone looks at you sideways. You want to leave at the top of your game. And I haven't figured out what that looks like yet, but it will be soon, unfortunately. Well, fortunately, it's just the way it is. Time for the next generation. The thing I would like to say is I have some incredibly good surgeons in our department and in the cardiac division, and we will not lose a step. I take great pride in the fact these people are as good as they are. Well, we've been so fortunate to have you as our chairman of surgery at this University of Virginia. I want to thank Dr. Crone for being with us today. Irv, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you today. Great to see you again, officially and unofficially. Thank you.